You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY. DIY. Oh. Musician. Musician. Podcast. Hey there, and welcome to episode number 119 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin, and joining me for this roundtable edition are Chris and the Bolt. Howdy. Hello. We're all in the same room. I know. And, and it's been a while, so you guys are so nice and close and cozy. It's so cute. <laughs> for, yeah, for those of you who can't see, we're, our faces are about 11 inches, From 10 inches, Can you 9 feel? inches. <laughs> Can you... <laughs> The tension in this room could be uh, yeah yeah we <laughs> cut with the knife. We uh, have only two mics today, so so we get to share. Yeah, they get to <laughs> share, but they like it. Lots of stuff been going on. Um, we were just having uh, a rather enjoyable discussion about internet memes and how to capitalize on them. Everyone needs to check out Stereo Skifja, Techno Cat. Oh, Techno Cat. Okay, I, I didn't realize there was another name for it. We were also laughing about the oh. Oh my, Omer Gerd or Oh my Gerd, Omer Gerd, Omer Gerd, which I hadn't heard, first. which I hadn't heard of before, <laughs> but I'm probably I'll probably see it everywhere now. Just type in one word, Oh my Gerd or Omer Gerd into uh, it's like Oh my God, but with R's. Oh, okay, I see. All this, that that's what you have to do to be famous these days. Yeah, is just you just make up sort of a uh, what was the chef from um, Swedish chef? The Swedish chef. Yeah, make up a Swedish chef language and uh, get some funny pictures. It. Put a cat. <laughs> on it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. In Portland, I don't. For those of you who have uh, familiar with the show, Portlandia, they have a uh, sketch where they do put a bird on it, and it's it's rather true here in Portland. Mm-hmm. There's birds. On everything, and Th- that's how you know the difference between art and, and not art. Yeah, not art. Yeah, there's put a, a bird, bird on it. But but to be internet famous, you just need to put a cat on it. Yeah, and then, and then you'll be internet famous. So, all right. Well, there's lots of good things to discuss. Uh, we have uh, a rather uh, big debate that was raging in the music industry this past week that we'll get to later about paying for music. I think it had everyone talking. Lots of people upset. Um, that's coming up. Everyone upset, just for different reasons. Yeah, everyone upset. I wasn't upset. I wasn't upset either. I was rather amused. But uh, (laughs) anyway, um, we've got that. And but first, we're gonna hit some news items. So let's do it. CD baby, CD baby, music, music, news. Well, back in July of 2011, YouTube stated that there were hundreds of YouTube channels making over $100,000 annually. Well, this week, YouTube announced that there are now thousands of channels making over $100,000 a year, pointing to the success of their ad and content ID program. There are no immediate signs of YouTube's popularity faltering, so I would expect this trend to continue. It's been a while since I got really excited over an Apple rumor, but this could actually be a big deal. Rumors are leaking that a massive overhaul of the iTunes software will be coming by the end of the year. First off, it'll undoubtedly build on the release of iCloud and have expanded cloud features, but there's some interesting things bubbling up in the rumor mill, like better music discovery in the store, and even some sharing options. Oh, and for you diehard Ping users, Ping will be dead. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Again, this update is rumored. No! <laughs> I know. All those fans and friends you built up there. <laughs> Again, this update is rumored to happen late in the year, so who knows what the final product will be, but it's definitely due for an overhaul. Lastly, sources close to Spotify are now saying that the free streaming ad-based company is now the number two source of revenue to major labels. Of course, they're just a second behind iTunes, but this is intriguing with all the discussion around Spotify and their effect on the music business. Of course, no official numbers were released, so you can expect the debate over Spotify to continue. 
And those were the headlines I saw. Some brief ones, but uh, some pretty big ones, I think. So iTunes pays the labels probably billions. Spotify pays them like a couple thousand. Maybe and a couple then bucks. and then third in line is no one. No one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the 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 article that that Spotify thing came from was from a, a business uh, website, and it was it it, it came from uh, the investment world because they're seeking funding. So I'm sure it's in some documents that they can't technically post live, but they're seeking, you know, more funding and, and such. So they probably have disclosed it in there. And Now, is this just, this is just streams for Spotify? Because I know in some countries, Spotify actually does sell downloads. Yeah, out in, in Europe, they sell downloads. So I think the majority of the revenue is still It's streams, still streaming. But they probably have big fees paid to them to license their catalogs too, right? Yeah, and, and that's where a lot of the debate is. People are upset that um, it appears that you know the, the major labels are getting uh, a much larger portion of payout for the, their streams compared to everybody else when a lot of people are saying they want transparency because a stream should be a stream no matter what. Yeah. And you know the interesting thing to the debate, the debate is in, in streaming services, I saw someone online who has a rather large... Uh, Twitter following say that Spotify for like 70,000 plays or 70 yeah 70,000 plays you'll only make 300 bucks and I thought you know on the one hand that can seem small but how I would like to see a direct comparison between you know if you had your song played on giant commercial radio in your city oh, one yeah. play would generate Technically, maybe a couple hundred thousand listens. You're not going to make a three hundred dollars, like nineteen cents. Yeah, or exactly. So, I see it more along the lines of comparing it to, like, radio. If some, if you're building a following, you're going to get a lot of. It's going to take a lot of plays, just like radio would. I mean, I think there's probably a middle ground there where Spotify should land, but I wouldn't expect seventy thousand plays to equal seventy thousand dollars. That's ridiculous. Right. Right. So. Going back to the, the YouTube thing, which kind of sparked our uh, conversation about memes or it kind of plays into it, uh, there's a lot of money to be made in YouTube. Uh, one, if you're an artist, there's two things that you can do. One, you should definitely take advantage of the CD Baby Sync program if you're in it, and uh, we will monetize your songs on YouTube and a whole bunch of other places um, so through you our partnership with Rumblefish. So you basically get paid every time your your music is is featured in a YouTube video. No, you get paid when an ad is clicked. Yeah, it's when an ad is clicked. Oh, okay. But that's really the only way that anyone gets paid. Correct. So, it uh, on YouTube. Yeah. So, it takes a lot of views again, but there's some interesting strategies, and I was actually over with the Rumblefish guys um, yesterday discussing this and talking about strategies artists are using to generate a lot of plays and there's some really cool things that we'll be covering in the coming weeks on the DIY Musician blog and probably talk about on the podcast but if you haven't listened to that episode all the way through it's like a couple episodes back my interview with Paul Anthony from Rumblefish check it out because understanding how it works is pretty key but there's some it, it you got to get yourself outside of the I'm a recording artist I'm going on the road I'm making a video for just as a traditional music video there's some cool things if you get outside of that mindset that you can do to take advantage of youtube and actually generate some money cat with videos. with cats cat and, and, of course. and birds I mean, yeah that's cats and you know film your cat for three minutes use your song as a soundtrack see where it goes well and that's before we started the podcast i was joking saying that my full-time job is just to follow around my cat and, <laughs> and uh and video it and put it on YouTube, although I don't have a cat, so. Has anyone done a music video yet uh, when they put the Alka-Seltzers in the Coke bottles in the background? Maybe I'll do that. Yeah, yeah I'm sure they have. I'm sure Aren't they people a little tired of that by now? Oh. Is that, I'm bringing it back. Bringing it back. <laughs> Isn't that like, that's like internet old. <laughs> that's like 2006. Yeah, yeah. man. <laughs> that's where my music oh, stopped sorry. developing, though. That's, so. like, that's like a thousand years in internet years. <laughs> But they, they, they told me about some cool contests that they did because the idea is with, with YouTube isn't just about necessarily your videos, which you can make lots of videos and, and by lots, start thinking in the tens or hundreds of videos type things, quick little videos that have your music on it. But uh, activating your fan base can be huge as far yeah. as like having a contest where they use your music 
and that can really generate a ton of views for your music. Not only get people discovering your music, but if they're clicking on ads and stuff, then you'll you'll start making some money. Um, You'd have a contest and just have all your fans film themselves eating breakfast cereal while listening to your music. Yeah, yeah. And then the other thing you can do is YouTube has, it's still kind of confusing, but they have their partner program, which still exists, but recently they opened up that possibility basically to anybody. So you've probably seen inside your YouTube account, hey, monetize your channel. There's a big thing, there's a big difference between a channel and your songs, and that's what you need to remember. Your channel are the actual videos, your songs are the music, but if you uh, monetize your channel, then the videos you upload can be monetized, and those may not even have your music in it. It could be just some random video that... Tuning can, your guitar or something. Yeah, I mean, anything. It doesn't have to do with the audio. It has to do with the video content itself. So those are a couple things. We'll be talking a lot about those coming up. You'll see a lot on the CD Baby blog at DIYmusician.cdbaby.com uh, about that because there's some really cool things. And I think it's, you know, it's still taking off. I still say YouTube is going to be a huge part of how musicians make money. You've been saying it for years. I know. So far, I haven't been wrong. <laughs> well, people aren't making the money, but it's still growing and the opportunities there. <laughs> but since when have anyone been making money on music? It's the music come industry. On. Come on. <laughs> Um, and iTunes, man, when I saw this, I was like, finally, that thing is so long overdue. Yeah. If it wasn't for the store, I mean, as far as organizing your music, it is way outdated. And I've been using iTunes Match, um, and that service needs a lot of work, too. As I've actually found it to be kind of clunky and really difficult. It doesn't match a lot of things and the funny thing is iTunes match if you bought any sort of enhanced album through iTunes like LP or um, anything that had a digital booklet it won't match it in the cloud because of that digital booklet and it's just it's just really weird so I feel like iTunes is the one part of Apple that just turned into a Frankenstein monster a lot of like companies develop tools that um, they just keep on adding features and they keep on having to, you know, be backward compatible with stuff. And you end up with this sort of Frankenstein's monster of software. And um, and it becomes really hard to simplify things and, and make it more user friendly once you have so many people using the software with different desires and needs. I mean, iTunes, you know, it's like people use it for file conversion. They use it for creating playlists. They use it for buying music, watching movies, like there's buying books, buying books. Yeah. It's crazy. Yeah. And, and it's podcasting and radio listening. And, and it's just, I think that now that the, the landscape is becoming a little bit more familiar and they're, and content um, providers are starting to realize how things can be presented in a cleaner way. Apple is, is, yeah, it's long overdue, but it's kind of exciting, too. We probably will have to say goodbye to some features that well, we're Ping used to. Well, is definitely, his, I mean, that, that was still just a rumor, but there's no reason for them to keep it. That was pretty much dead on arrival. Right. But, uh, nobody even, they don't even talk about it. It's, you know, they're, they're not going to create a social network inside iTunes, mainly just because, you know, Apple is pretty controlling and it's worked out for them in a lot of things, but... That's just one place where social network, you can't force all these rules and regulations. you got to let some freedom. And Twitter is just far superior to anything they're going to yeah. come up with. And the, I, I anticipate they'll have just heavy Facebook and, and uh, Twitter integration like they're working on for their iOS. Yeah, and... but they've been long overdue. This latest version of iTunes, I think it's on iTunes 10 or whatever. I was expecting for them to roll out a completely new interface and uh, much better search options in the store, but they didn't. In fact, I thought they made the interface with the actual music software worse because when you're like all the little icons for your catalog, like podcasts and stuff, instead of them having color and they all went gray and it made it even more difficult to kind of look at. And so I have a feeling this will be just a completely big overhaul. Just take all right. Well, let's get on to some uh, discussion. Um, this uh, past couple weeks. A lot of people have been talking. It's kind of a hot button issue for uh, the music industry. So, and so, so, where to start? Whether it was well, like Chris an article. Is, Chris is gonna fill us in on the, the the two main articles that launched the conversation, and then 
where it went from there. Yeah, I, I'll, so I guess I'll start at the beginning and ca- catch us up to speed for anyone that hasn't been paying attention, and then we can discuss from there. But essentially, Emily White, who is a 20 or 21-year-old intern at NPR's All Songs Considered, um, wrote an article for their blog called I Never Owned Any Music to Begin With. And it was a response to Bob Boylan's article, he's the guy that runs All Songs Considered, where he was talking about, oh, I just deleted all of my music collection, I'm trusting my music to the cloud, isn't this sort of this revolutionary big deal? And so Emily wrote, no, it's not really a big deal because I never bought any music ever. I have 11,000 songs in my iTunes library, I never bought a single one of them, I've probably spent like $14 on music in my life. Um, And at the same time as she's kind of justifying the free music trend of, well, I was going to say her generation, but I think of every generation at this point. But uh, she's also aware that there's something wrong with it. Uh, She's not exactly sure, but the article kind of does grapple a little bit with the question of, I'm aware that by stealing, by taking all this music, I'm letting my prejudices uh, out, out as a, out as I'm retelling the story, but um, just what do you really think, Chris? <laughs> this is unbiased coverage. Um, she's aware that by not paying for music, um, artists are financially suffering. She doesn't know what the solution is, and she's pretty sure that no one in her generation is ever going to purchase music again. She wants a more convenient solution, a kind of. Uh, uh, one place to go to get everything you'd ever want to listen to. And, and she says, if that's available, then uh, she can imagine paying for the convenience of that. So in response to this article, David Lowry, who is the singer of Cracker and Camper Van Beethoven, kind of just tore into her and said, how much more convenient do you want things? You've already got iTunes and Spotify and all these things that essentially get you uh, music instantaneously for very cheap. Um, and then he also went into a lot of the economics of um, saying that, you know, everyone uh, blames labels and say, oh, we don't need to pay la- la- uh, pay for music because labels are corrupt and this and that. But he's saying, you know, there are cases of that, but essentially labels were responsible for defending artists' copyrights. Yes, because it benefited them, but also they ensured that the artists would get paid. And now also lots of copyright holders, artists are putting out music on their own. They're their own labels. So when you're not paying for music and you're justifying it by, you know, sticking it to the labels, you're just sticking it directly to the artists. So that's maybe a be- good beginning point for the discussion. Yeah. There's lots more to it, but yeah, there's, th- yeah, there's lots of things in there. And, you know, I think uh, one of the things you touched on just there then is that in general, there's always been, a, a, I think, a misunderstanding of how the music business actually makes its money. They make their money off of exploiting copyrights, which in turn, the artist reaps the benefit of that exploitation. I think on the artist side, where a lot of frustration happens is one is they don't understand how it really works either when they get into that situation. And there's some there's a lot of uh, underhanded or hidden things in a contract that can screw over the artist. Let's, you know, be fair. But a lot of times the artist just doesn't understand the trade-off they're getting for getting that mass exposure from a label. So those kind of things kind of have, you know, the the misconception of how the money works and then uh, uh, not understanding some of the finer points that... uh, cause them to feel screwed and a lot of times artists are screwed over but because they take advantage of that uh naivety because they don't know and they just want to be famous and Mm -hmm. but at the same time if you're working with a good label it can be a great relationship especially if you've got you're in a part of a catalog where the people are actually working at trying to make money from it years later when you may not even be touring anymore your career may be over but you've got some decent catalog pieces that they keep generating money from and that's where the relationship really can pay off for you in the long run um but anyway so i understand his point of view and uh her point of view it, it was just interesting you know i think a lot of people probably read it and went yeah i see what she's saying i don't, I don't pay for music either but you know i don't know that i'd post that publicly on npr's blog <laughs> and, and sort of yeah <laughs> treat it as some justification or, or explanation rather i guess I don't know how, uh, to me, the argument, it seems so strange because if I've written a song, I own the copyright to it, 
I get to say, as the law stands, I get to say how it's distributed, who distributes it, and for how much. Yeah, granted, you have to make uh, yeah. concessions to the distributors you're working with, but if someone has it and they didn't pay for it, and I say that everyone has to pay for my music, then they are breaking the law. You can call it whatever you want, but it is breaking the law. So that leaves us with two, two outcomes, I guess. One being all copyright owners, or most of them, would have to get together and figure out a way to enforce the existing law, or society has to change the law to fit the changing values. Mm -hmm. So if we decide as a society that we want free music, that's fine, but the laws need to change. So as it exists, it's like, you yeah. are stealing my music. That's like, I think literally true. Yeah. Uh, unless I say you can give it away or that you take yeah. it. But I think that, I think probably the event, the eventuality is that both things need to change. The law needs to change and the way that, you know, obviously the way we monetize music is changing as we speak. But um, I think that there's this, there's this feeling that something just by everyone, you know, by, by consumers, that something that is digital and infinitely reproducible does not have the same value as something that's physical. And I think it's going to be almost impossible to shake that feeling. I mean, you see it happening with software, you see it happening with music, with books, um, people just don't expect to pay as much or sometimes pay anything for something that is can so easily be um, both distributed and disappear. You know, it's yeah. something that can just <clears throat> get deleted off your computer and disappear into the ether. Yeah. yeah. Well, and I think for me personally, to me, the, the, for me personally, the issue really comes down to sort of like, music discovery issue it's like i'm not gonna buy something without n knowing whether or not i might like it and i i buy i would say that i probably buy more music than i used to when i was just cds and blindly buying it unless it was uh, i was a big fan of that that artist but at the same time i'm more willing to you know have somebody who's you know as a friend oh you should check out this album and then give me some files and me check it out and listen to it and not feel like i'm doing anything wrong because i had no idea who they were i wasn't going to check them out anyway and that's where it's kind of like ultimately where some of that piracy can help the artist to a point like controlled piracy but to a point, to where's a point. the point? I don't and know. That's the thing. Um, I guess another thing I could mention now is that um, this these two articles spurned probably hundreds, if not thousands, of more articles from industry pundits yeah, and all kinds was, of people. It was all the rage. But uh, yeah, one of them that was really interesting was Dave Allen, who's a, a Portlander here, and um, he wrote a piece defending Emily and also uh, tearing into uh, David Lowry. And kind of saying that he's just a victim of the past. He can't think past, uh, you know, the the, the 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 revolution that's going on now in monetization and, and reproduction of digital uh, files and all this stuff. And um, so Dave is um, essentially uh, faulting David Lowry for um, being nostalgic, you know, for this world that pr maybe never really even existed. But I didn't see in Dave's. Uh, uh, piece a clear vision for the future which i'm not faulting him for that i don't it's tough to see what the future would be when you're in the middle of all this upheaval but i didn't see a clear solution to like mm -hmm. to the central problem that like when you are an artist it's not just the fact that you um you, it, there's all the production costs if you want to make a really great album it costs a lot of money you don't have to press a single cd but you probably spent thousands and thousands of dollars to make the record and then it's just free beyond that point. So how do you recoup that? Like, and Dave is always saying, sell T-shirts. The I think the whole sell T-shirts thing, one's kind of a cop out. It's lame, and it sounds like somebody who's never been an artist. Even though Dave Allen has been right. an artist, but I could say he's living in the past because the whole sell T-shirts thing. Maybe th he he also apply. might be using that as a stand-in for sell T-shirts, sing, license your music. You know, like. Kind of think of all the other solutions besides just selling your music product. Yeah, yeah. and licensing your music, that's another one I see people throw out there, which is another <laughs> cop-out. It's not just like, oh, if only I just thought about, I'll just go license <laughs> my music and right. I just turn that switch on. 
I mean, you got to look for those opportunities, and it's becoming, you know, things like we were talking about YouTube and um, other places becoming, opening up more opportunity for that income. You know, the sale of a CD or, or a download is re- relatively small to the to the compared to someone coming to like a show even twice. You know, and spending ten bucks per ticket or whatever. So, I think that I think sometimes we think that there was this like glory days. I mean that that the music industry wasn't always hard for artists that like at some point like you know medium to small artists could make a good living like there's a sort of <laughs> assumption which that, was never true which was never <laughs> true yeah and I I wonder if you took like artists from you know 10 years ago 20 years ago 50 years ago and you looked at like who were making money how many of those people were actually making a living how many people were actually making a good lo- good living and I think that there might not even be a difference. There might be, you yeah. know, almost no noticeable change between like the number of musicians who can make a good living in America now as to 50 years ago. A lot of these articles, someone will say it's worse than it's ever been before. And I would never agree with that because, you know, I remember in when I was in college in Nashville, you know, nobody, the whole game was trying to get some A&R guy at a label to even give you a chance so you could go and lose money. We're, we're recording <laughs> with a label. You can make a great sounding record and then drift off into obscurity. But yeah. now you can do that on your own. <laughs> <laughs> well, so, and also I realized as I was saying the thing about people coming, coming to the show, I probably sound ungrateful. I'm, I'm not. I would rather they have my music, rather they share their appreci- appreciation with me, and rather they be at the show. I just I also don't know what the solution is to uh, extending that to a place where I can continue to do it and not feel like I'm starting to like go into the red. It really is kind of a perfect storm. You take like, you flood the market with product and then you make it infinitely copyable and super (laughs) cheap. (laughs) And in the middle of a recession. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, and I think the sentiment that, you know, you had mentioned that someone coming up to you and saying that like they just copied a hitter. I remember you you talking about that, and then tons there were, of people. There, there was a Hello Morning show that we had, and um, someone came up to me and telling me they loved the the music, and it was you know somebody that I had no rela- It didn't. It wasn't a friend. wasn't a friend of a friend. It was just some random person. So I'm like, oh cool. How did you find out about us? Oh, I just copied it from you know something. I'm like, <laughs> ah, you know, it's just like <laughs> I'm glad at the same time I'm. Are glad they enjoyed it, or they say they were saying they love. I've, I've had it where someone was telling me they loved it too. Like and I'm like, I need to get the album. I'm like, oh, we got them over here. I'm like, oh, I'll just go down. I'll just, Let's just go I'll just get, get rip it, it off later. BitTorrent. That's what they told me <laughs> once. I'm like, oh man. I'd like to take this moment to admit to a, a recent felony that I uh, participated in. Um, just to give an example of how you know um, this is on record. I know it's on record. I'm just going to go ahead and admit it. Um, my girlfriend's father just bequeathed to me two giant bins of CDs, probably over a thousand CDs, um, a good many of which were probably, um, bootlegged from the internet. And, um, and he's, you know, like he was very excited to give them to me. I've just, I just became his acquaintance. He just moved to Portland and it was his big thing that he wanted to give to me. And I'm grateful and it's awesome sixties and seventies music. Um, and yeah, I guess I'm, I, you know, like I know that not all of it was paid for (laughs) and, uh, did you ask him for a sales record? No, I didn't ask him for a sales record. I mean, the guy, the guy probably Sharpie on the CDR gave it away. Maybe (laughs) there are very few album covers, many, many Sharpied, uh, uh, CDs. And, uh, you know, like I, I, I actually feel good about it because I feel like it was sort of a token, a way of us to sort of become friends um, upon him moving to Portland and share uh, an interest, which is music. Um, But I also, from another perspective, see how that sort of sharing is, you know, just as, you know, people aren't just going on to LimeWire, going on to these Pirate Bay or wherever, whatever, wherever people get music these days. Like the music is so shareable that you can just hand someone a tub of CDs (laughs) and they can fill up their music collection or their iPod or their computer with it. Well, and going back to the original story that started this, that's what this uh, girl, Emily White, um, said that, you know, she was working at her college radio station and just basically took all the music from the radio station. And uh, 
So the funny thing about this story, I'd be curious to see what happens to her, if anything, because if the RIAA will shake down some uh, single mom for like 28 questionable tracks on their hard drive that they could not identify where they came from, this girl just publicly admitted to 11,000 tracks saying she stole. Not to mention what I just uh, admitted. Luckily, I go in there a pseudonym, The Bolt. (laughs) (laughs) They'll never find it. Never figure that one out. (laughs) I, uh, before we get much further, I was going to mention one last thing about David Lowry's piece, piece, which I don't necessarily agree with, but I thought it was interesting and probably crucial to his argument, which was that um, the the free music spree that's going on, he compared to a neighborhood in which that was being looted, um, and uh, instead of the police coming to stop the looting, they uh, kind of sit at the borders and they allow it. And then not only that, but there's this other group of people that are charging admission to get into the neighborhood so you can loot. And those are the ISPs, Verizon, Comcast, Google, all the people who uh, facilitate the sharing of free sharing of music that profit off of it. And then none of that money ever ends up going to the copyright holders. So, right. And I, I mean, I think that's interesting. I think that the, I think all in all, you know, like we really have to look, start looking at, you know, books and movies and music all in sort of the same light. Like you're basically, you're getting an experience. You're getting an online experience, an audio experience, visual experience. And the way you're getting that is through, you know, through both the hardware and the internet connection, you know, your internet provider. And to me, it kind of makes sense for money from some, from the hardware and internet, um, payments that we make for that to go to some of the content creators. And the thing that, to me, the, the, this part of the this equation that I'm not sure is a reality is, you know, they'll say millennials don't want to pay this or that. But I, I don't know that that's really true. It's just that demographic is in college, early 20s. Whenever did college kids pay for anything right. <laughs> and have lots of expendable income? I understand that now they're just getting it for free, but I think as people get older, there's this thing of, you know, I'd rather pay for something than waste all my time Searching trying for to it online. get it for free. Right. And when you're younger, you don't have money, so you find other ways to get it. Where when you get older, time is more valuable, and you, in most cases, have a job and an income, and it's easier to just pay for something. Or, or subscribe to something, you know, I, I think in movies using something like Netflix is a good example. A lot of people subscribe to that. I don't know what the payment breakdown is with Netflix compared to like Spotify and streaming services. So, And I think it's also important to remember that music has always been, way before the internet, has always been this incredibly shareable thing. It's something that sharing is built into music. I mean, that's what it's supposed to be. It's about sharing emotions, about sharing tunes with people, about, you know, I mean, songs were passed from generation to generation, and they developed, and I think... Changed. And changed and transformed, and I think that, you know, for a part for a period of time in our history, like, we f- figured out some really great ways of monetizing music um, as, like, this solid physical product, but it never was a solid physical product, and in a way, now that it's becoming less of a physical product, it's kind of going back to the way it was before, more of something that can be shared and developed upon. I mean, you see all these people doing remixes and using other people's music to turn it into something else. This is something that's been going on since music began. <laughs> well, I think where maybe, you know, Chris, you touched on laws being changed, or both of you were talking about that. I think the one thing that artists wants is um, one a little bit more clarity and transparency on what the payouts are and it to be the same song for song no matter whose catalog it came from I think a lot of the the outrage over things like Spotify is that you know it, they're saying they're the number two the labels made you know they're the number two service but how much of that was prepayment and how much of that was just pain to have access to those core catalogs that don't apply to everybody and that's where i think some transparency and some 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 regulation is probably going to happen just so that you know people can 
know what they're even dealing with and Ooh. understand their opportunity to even monetize these services before Spotify gets thrown in the, the bad pile and everyone's saying, oh, it's destroying the music business. Well, maybe if we all could just see what, you know, how we're going to, how the money is generated and what we're going to make off of it right. in a clear way, we can all have a better understanding where, you know, I could go and easily find out how much I would get off of being a songwriter on a song that gets placed on a CD and sells in a retail store. That's easy. You know, nine right. cents. That's very clear. And uh, But with Spotify and some of these streaming services, it's just, it's unclear. And then people like Sound Exchange, you know, come in the picture and you're like, is, is it, is everyone just, you know, yeah. giving us a line or is this really? What's the, actually the, going on yeah. here? I mean, I think, I think Spotify could pay more probably. And I think that if they can't afford it, then they could probably make more money by raising prices or using better advertising or whatever. I mean, I think that hopefully in the future they'll be able to do that. I don't know if that's part of their agenda, but um, I think that would be cool. I was just going to say to counter what you were just proposing about a uniform fees per streams, if we just bring like simple supply and demand into the discussion, if 300 people a month listen to my song on Spotify and 3 million or 300 million listen to Lady Gaga's, her song is probably worth a lot more than mine is, even at a streaming level. But, yeah. I And, and that's where the, the challenge comes in because you could say that, you know, if the PROs like ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC worked like you know it's kind of described they should be working that wouldn't matter because she would just be getting like say that was in radio she'd be getting the performance royalties performance royalty equal to the amount of performances and you would as well unfortunately unless you reach a certain point they're not paying for performance royalties but if they paid one for one you know this x amount for a single play based on the revenue they collect then streaming could be it. uniform and then you add a you digital would, yeah, performance yeah it but um you know th- that is the thing where in that sense where someone like lady gaga would um i mean there's still going to be cd sales there's still going to be a whole bunch of other things that go around it um usually an artist that big can make serious money off a tour and i don't know it's it's not it's not a simple solution but i don't think that um a stream of a lady gaga track one to one should be more than a stream of one of your tracks necessarily yeah i don't think so either i mean i think that it's it's about where your eyeballs and where your ears are as far as these companies are concerned you know they spotify wants all the uh they want all the Lady Gaga listeners to log in and be listening to music, but they also want everybody who doesn't listen to Lady Gaga and listens to the obscure stuff and, and want want their eyeballs to see the ads and want their you know, them to log in time on their service and, and not other services. Yeah. And that's, you know, uh, I think one pair of eyeballs or one pair of ears are as valuable as, as any other pair of eyeballs and yeah. ears. Speaking of uh, their ads, they're a little tricky. Uh little sly with their ads. You mean if, with the volume being you, twice as much as the song? If you turn the volume off, it pauses the ad. Uh, and if you turn the volume down, it can only go so far before it pauses the ad. So you have to well, hear the ad. I actually discovered this trick last night. It's very uh, technical. I was listening to Spotify, and I went through probably like four albums. And about the second album, I got really sick of the ads, so I realized you just talk back to them. It makes it really fun. <laughs> you can shout, you can argue, you can refute whatever the ads are saying. It's awesome. I just get annoyed try it because they're, you know, considerably louder than the music you're listening to, and you're listening to some nice music, and then suddenly it's like, blah, 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 blah. just like, shout back. Mm. It'll make it all really fun. I've I've found that if you take the headphones off, oh. that's another high tech way to <laughs> get around it. Well, I was going to ask you guys, how, how do you guys listen to your music? Because I have. Um, I have powered speakers and a and a little amp, so I can just turn down the the volume yeah. on that. I, I'm just if you do it on your computer, that's when it takes up. Yeah. So interesting. interesting. I didn't even know that. Interesting. I mean, you get a little a little uh, some external speakers that have their own volume, and they're not going to be able to know when you turn that up and down. Hmm. They'll find a way <laughs> eventually. 
When Google is inside your mind. <laughs> well, do we have any other final thoughts about people? Not did you have some comments from the blog or? There were tons of comments, but we go, go to the our blog you, at DIYMusician.CDBaby.com. You'll see tons of people talking, weighing in, emoting. Lots of lots of angry people on both sides. Yeah. And there's lots of good arguments. I mean, I feel like I, I, I my tendency is to deconstruct everything, um, but I think that. Yeah, I mean, the, there is a lot of money out there and a lot of people, you know, willing to pay for music and, and willing to, you know, subscribe to, to Comcast and Netflix and uh, Pandora and everything. And, and I do think independent artists should get a fair share. Yeah. Well, I think it's also important that the, as far as, like I said earlier, a lot of people in the conversation – have no idea how the old traditional music business really works. And that that's kind of, calling it the old traditional music business is kind of, you know, not really fair either because it's still very much how people make money. They make money off of exploiting copyrights, whether it's streams, whether it's downloads, or whether it's CDs or radio airplay, whatever. And I think, you know, it, to educate yourself, picking up a book like uh, Everything You Need to Know About the Music Business by Donald Passman, that's a really good resource that kind of explains it. And when you have better understanding, it's it's easier to understand both sides of the story, you know, and and the argument and understand why, you know, the, the folks at the record labels or artists like uh, David Lowry, they're not just pissed because they're old sticks in the mud. Um, they're pissed because they created something that the market said was valuable and now um, it's getting passed Devalued. around for free. Mm-hmm. It'd just be like if, you know, Apple makes iPhones, suddenly someone's put, giving them out for free, Apple's going to stop making iPhones. And we really don't want artists to stop making art. And I think that that's the, the core of the issue is educating the public that art has value. We all, No matter how we get it, we understand that it has value in our lives. So how are we going to deal with this issue to make sure that that value gets transferred to the people that are making the art? Yeah, I think that's well said. Well, in there, then. <laughs> Amen. So if you'd like to weigh in, you can do so on our blog, or you can email us. Uh, but what is our new? Podcast at cdbabypodcast.com is our new email address. Yeah, we, uh, we changed it because the old one was just riddled with spam. We've had that email address for... Uh, five since, years <laughs> yeah and the amount of spam coming into it every day was maddening so podcast at cdbabypodcast.com you can email us there and also you can call our listener line which is a newer number for those of you who have been listening for a long time or just recently went through a lot of episodes it's uh, a newer number than what we've talked about in the past and that number is 360 Five two four two two zero nine, and just call it. Leave a message. It's a Google Voice number, and that gets delivered to my email, so you will be heard. We still need a song um, about Kevin and Chris. We had one uh, user submit a song about me, and we don't have songs about these guys yet. Uh, so if you feel creative, if no one participates, I could write one about you, and you could write one okay. about me. <laughs> All right. <laughs> And then I'll just get it free on the internet from yeah. somebody. <laughs> but we'd rather hear it from you. Yeah. And you yeah. being the, the, the royal you, the collective you. The collective you. The plural you. massive CD Baby podcast audience. Yes. <laughs> Actually, that's not the royal you, is it? The royal we is singular. I don't know. Even plural what you. About. The plural everybody. Irma Gerd. <laughs> Irma Gerd. All Irma right. are first. <laughs> well, we did it. A new episode. And uh, we'll end there. Adios. See ya. See ya. Bye. <laughs> you, 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 you've been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 